everybody. So glad to see you here this morning. Here to worship the Lord and learn from His Word. Amen. Yes. All right. All right. Yeah, you, you got to love the body of Christ. Uh, I was just standing talking to somebody, and they said, "Can I do something for you? What? Can I clean your glasses?" <laughs> How embarrassing! Yeah, I'm like, I could see you fine. <laughs> Body of Christ, amen? All right, let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much, Lord, for, for just the, the common thread that we, we, that we love you, Jesus. And that's why we're here this morning. So we want to sit at your feet, God, and just learn from you. Your yoke is easy and your burden is light, and we just worship you this morning, God. We love you in Jesus' name. the time to worship come now is the time to give your heart come just as you are to worship come just as you are
children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming in your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you
See my victory When all I see is the mountain You see a mountain move And as I walk through the shadow Your heart surrounds me There's nothing to fear now
Guys sound wonderful up there this morning. Anyway, let's turn to somebody and greet them. Turn to somebody and greet them this morning with the love of Christ.
now you got me all self-conscious. <laughs> oh my goodness. Ah! I just, yes. It's all right. Highly trained professional. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome. So a few announcements for you this morning. First, this Thursday, ladies' prayer, 6.30. I encourage each and every one of you, if you are a lady, if you know what a woman is, then come on out for that. 6.30 here at the church. Um, married couples. Uh, you know what? We went out. Uh, there was the marriage conference uh, this weekend. Uh, Michelle and I went out Friday night. I know a couple of other couples uh, went out yesterday. Um, wonderful time. Wonderful time out there. Great supporting our other churches. Um, however, our marriage ministry here at CCRS, that is going to be this Friday, the 18th at 6.30. It is a Mexican-themed potluck. So check with Dollar if you have any questions on that. Uh, for everyone else, save the date. The next movie night is August 13th, Saturday, August 13th. Doors open at 6.30, starts at 7. What did I say? Oh, 19th, yes. 19th, no, don't, don't be here today. <laughs> well, actually, do be here today because we have the uh, fireside chat, okay? So come on out for that. Yes, it's supposed to be the first Saturday, or excuse me, first Sunday of every month. However, it is now going to be the second Sunday of every month. So mark your calendars on that. You know what? We're too busy as a church. We're always doing something the first weekend. It's crazy. It's crazy. Um, I also want to address an issue that came up. So the movie that we're going to be playing next week is Nefarious. Now, this is a rated R movie. A bunch of us have already gone to the theater in order to see it. And as such, do you want to know what the worst thing was in this movie? The previews. And the previews and all the other trailers leading up to this movie, there were all kinds of obscenities and it was just disgusting. However, there's not a single cuss word in this. There's no nudity or anything along those lines. The reason why they gave it a rated R uh, uh, moniker, if you will, is because there is an execution scene. That's it. However, basically, what this whole movie is about is about spiritual warfare. Folks, we are going through spiritual warfare in this world today. Can I get an amen? amen. So there's nothing more poignant than this movie. So I encourage you, come on out for that. Uh, free popcorn and hot dogs. Also, invite somebody else. That's the other thing about these movies. It's not just for us, but also an opportunity for the community to come in and see this. So having a movie that's a little bit more cutting edge, if you will, you know, um, uh, th that's going to draw some people that might not, you know, normally set foot in a church into a church. If I show VeggieTales, the movie, you know, don't get me wrong. Actually, that'll be playing in the kids' room, <laughs> okay, for them. And, and I do, the only thing that I would caution you is if you have any teenagers, they need to be mature in their faith. Otherwise, outside of that, come on out. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be a great time. Yes, pastor has previewed it and gives it a thumbs up. It's played in churches all across this country also. Um, now, if you are interested in serving in the church, there are opportunities for you. Back with our AV crew, uh, back with the children's ministry. See either Joan or James for that. If God places it upon your heart, let's get up there. Let's, let's serve. Um, also, Light of the World, that is going to be here just before we know it. That is one of our biggest outreaches that we do. And thousands of pieces of candy go out for that. So, start collecting them now. Um, next time you go to, a, to the store, just pick up an extra bag and then throw it into the uh, basket that's out in the foyer. If you have any questions, you can see Tiffany regarding that. Or Sonia. Sonia, raise your hand. There we go. That's Sonia. <laughs> Lastly, um, we have another one of our outreaches. It is our night of worship. Now, <laughs> I know most of it is during the day. It starts at 2 o'clock and it'll go until 9 o'clock. But, um, you know, day of worship, it just doesn't sound the same. Come out to Dow. But come out to now. 
Hey, that's got a ring to it. Anyway, uh, that is going to be August 26th, Saturday. Uh, food vendors, uh, food, uh, food trucks, vendors, all of that stuff. So come on out. Now, we had flyers made. They're out in the foyer. I encourage you, take five of them. Take five. Hand one out to the neighbor across the street. Hand one to the neighbor that lives in behind you. One to each side. And then take one and stick it on your refrigerator so you don't forget. <laughs> and there you go. I don't ask you guys to evangelize a lot, but that's the easiest thing you can do, okay? So hand out those flyers, okay? Get, let's get uh, as many from the community to come on out for that. And that is all that I have for announcements. All right, so now I've got to put my collar on and turn into my pastor self now. <laughs> the highest reward for a person's toil is not what they get, but what they become by it. John Ruskin. That's a quote from an English writer and philosopher of the Victorian era, but I think it leads directly to our prodigal son today. Now, we're going to do things a little bit differently. We're going to reread the first two parables in chapter 15 in the book of Luke, and then we'll get to our prodigal son. Now, what I want you guys to do is every time that you see the words lost, found, rejoice, I want you to underline those. I want you to highlight them. I want you to go ahead and put a star next to them. Now, if there's anybody who needs a Bible, uh, raise your hand, and one of the ushers will come around and give you one. So we're going to be starting in verse 4 in the chapter 15 of the book of Luke. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost, put an underline under it, until he finds it. And when he has found it, underline it, he lays, on his, lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing, underline rejoicing. And when, it comes, when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, rejoice, underline it. With me, for I have found, underline it, my sheep which was lost, underline it. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Continuing in verse 8. Or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp? Sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, underline it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and saying, Rejoice, underline it, with me, for I have found, underline it, the peace which, was, which I lost, underline it. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Lost, found, rejoice. Have you ever been lost? Some, if not all of us at one time or another, has been spiritually lost or at least felt that separation from God. But have you ever been lost? I mean, really lost. Like maybe you were driving in Mexico or some part of the country that you've never been to before. There's no signal for your driving app. There's no Thomas guide in a car. Okay. Remember those? It was a map. Yeah, it was a map, right? We used to carry those. <laughs> No Thomas guy, not even an old man in a rocking chair at a filling station saying, well, you go down the road, you make a right at the big stump, turn left at the Johnson's farm, and in about 30 minutes as the crow flies. How about as the car drives? I remember as a small child going to a department store with my father. I always enjoyed going to the store with him. First, there was a sense of security and safety. He was a tall man, about six foot. I know what happened to you, Adam. <laughs> I'll have you know I'm the perfect size for my height. He was born and raised on the tough city streets of New York. And there was always that safety that was there with him. But when we went to the department stores, there was also that chance that I might make it down one of the toy aisles. Yeah, and I don't remember one time we had gone out. I don't remember whether it was Sears or Macy's. But the first chance I got, Adam wandered off and went to the coveted toy aisle. The chance that I could go ahead and put on a few more things onto my Christmas list. And I hurried back to where my father was standing, and I grabbed the man's hand, and I looked up. It was not my father. 
I was terrified. I was mortified. It was, I was so stick, it was like so, so deep scared. This was a department store. It was attached to a mall. How was I ever going to find my father? I was truly lost. And then when I started to lose all hope, I heard my father's voice, Adam! <laughs> There's never been a more pleasant, reassuring sound <laughs> than your name being called by your father. I once was lost, but now was found. And it can be a pretty scary thing to be spiritually lost. Sure, we're distracted with our sin, even entertained or pleasured, but everything is lost. Then desperation starts to set in. And it's not a pretty place to be, not just in a department store, but in life without our heavenly father. There is a void that abuse and substance and sex, drugs, and rock and roll just can't fill. But to hear the father's voice, to be called back into his loving arms when we wander, when we stray, to see him run to us, to feel him wrap those loving arms around us, there's no better feeling. Today, we're going to see a son who wanders, not in a department store, but off to a far-off country. He wastes his possessions on prodigal living. He was lost, but is found. And when found, the father rejoices. The title of today's message is Lost, Found, and Rejoice. We are all prodigals. Would you pray with me? Precious Heavenly Father, we come before you. We open up your word. And Lord, we ask that you would give us understanding. And Lord, that we would be able to take your word and apply it directly to our lives. Lord, maybe there are those that have come here today that are prodigal sons. Maybe they're elder sons. Maybe their walk isn't where it should be. Lord, I pray that if that's the case, that we are reminded as we go through this parable, Lord, that you're there with open arms waiting for us, no matter how deplorable our sin may be. If we're only good to ask for repentance, to say that I'm sorry, and then make our way back to you. So precious Heavenly Father, as we look at your word, I pray that you would etch it upon our hearts. And God, if there's anything of man, let it fall upon deaf ears. You know how much we love you, we thank you, we sing your praises. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. So we'll be starting in Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Now, first off, no, it was not unlawful in order to ask for his inheritance. Now, usually it was given much later in life, and the father would have been well advanced in years or sick or even on their deathbed. Now, although not unlawful, it was still considered shameful. The younger son would have received half of what the elder son received. Turn with me now to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy chapter 21, and we're going to take a look at verse 16 and 17. And in verse 16, it states... Then it shall be on the day he bequeaths his possessions to his sons that he must not bestow firstborn status on the son of the loved wife in preference to the son of the unloved, the true firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the unloved wife as the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has. For he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. Now, in the ancient world, the prodigal son probably would have been like a teenager um, and or single. And the early Jews, they warned fathers about breaking up their estate too soon. But here, the father grants the request. And it's an illustration how God permits each person to go his or her own way. That each of us has the free will to either choose the father or reject him. Now, this would have also been shameful from the son's perspective because it was as if he was saying, I want to break the ties. I don't want to have anything to do with you. I want your goods from you, but not a relationship with you. And it would have been shameful from the father's perspective because he knew 
his son was saying exactly this. Proverbs 28, 7 states, Whoever keeps the law is a discerning son, but a companion of gluttons shames his father. Now, when I left home, I wanted to be like this younger son here in our parable. Granted, I didn't ask for my inheritance, but when I graduated from high school, my father gave me a firm, hard handshake. And he said, son, I'm very proud of you. From now on, rent is this much. Food is this much. You want to go to college? I encourage you, but I'm not paying for it. Nineteen days later, I joined the military. <laughs> I left because I didn't want, not because I didn't want to have anything to do with my father, but because I had become my own man. I wanted to go out and prove myself that I could make it in this world and be out from under the yoke of bondage of my father's rules and regulations. <laughs> Funny, so joining the army was my way of getting outside of rules and regulations. I never said I was the sharpest tool in the shed, folks. <laughs> See, but I wanted my independence. I wanted to be able to live the way I wanted to live. Awful lot of eyes in that paragraph. I, too, would go on to live like the younger son in this parable and waste some of my youth with prodigal living. And as many of us here today, we can be much like that youngest son. That is, before we opened our hearts to the Lord. Verse 13, and not many days after the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Notice, where did he go? Did he go to the town that he was from? No, he went as far away from his father as he could. You see, we don't want our fathers to see how we're living, especially if it's a sinful life. Am I right? Yeah. So he attempts to get as far away as possible. And I believe that might be one reason why God made me the pastor here in Running Springs and not back in New York. They all knew me there. Verse 14. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Now, not that this prodigal son was living wisely in any manner of sense of the word, but even if he had better control over his finances, you can't control the economy. There was a famine. He lost everything. And when we get into bad situations, we will often do desperate things because desperate times then require desperate measures. Verse 15, then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. So, first we see he goes out, and what does it say? He joins himself to a citizen of the country. In other words, a Gentile. Now, he's not even really getting a job. What this means, more or less, that he sits there and he begs this Gentile, I'll do anything to be in your employ. Just tell me. I'll do it. And this Gentile was probably like, you know what? Then go feed my pigs. Just get out of here. Can you see it? And it says that he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods. But you see, the pods weren't edible. The food or pods that they fed the pigs were inedible for human consumption. Our bodies can't digest them. It's one of the reasons why they threw them off to the pigs. Now, feeding swine is not a glorious job for anyone. But for a Jewish person, especially since pigs were considered unclean by Levitical law, it was especially deplorable. Just know, pig slop never satisfies. Whether it's through career or your money or toys, if you're trying to find fulfillment or satisfaction, you'll hunger again. The Lord is the only one who will truly satisfy you deeply. John 6.35 states, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Verse 17, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned. Hold that thought. Against heaven and before you. 
and am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So first, I have sinned. That phrase appears seven times in Scripture. I have sinned, said Pharaoh, Exodus 9, 27. I have sinned, said Balaam, Numbers 22, 34. I have sinned, said Paul, 1 Samuel 15, 24. I have sinned, said Judas, Matthew 27, 4. Each of these men acknowledged their sin, but none of them repented. There's three more. I have sinned, said Achan, Joshua 20, excuse me, Joshua 7, verse 20. I have sinned, said David, 2 Samuel 12, 13. I have sinned, said our prodigal in this passage. And each repented. You see, it's not enough just to say, I've sinned, but true repentance takes place at the point that the sinner, like our prodigal son, changes direction and heads towards the Father. This brings us to our first point today. Repent and change direction. Repent and change direction. The son's word represents true repentance of a confessed sinner, and that's the first step. Romans 10 verse 9 states that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The son knows he's messed up. It says here that he came to himself. In other words, what we would say is he came to his senses. Now he knows that it's not going to be easy. He knows who he has to go to, what he has to do. You know, we can get so full of ourselves in our youth. I saw a meme that had said, encyclopedia set for sale. No longer need it. I have a teenager who knows everything. Those of us who have children, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And as parents, they think that we could never know what it was that they're going through. You know, I feel like a lot of times my kids felt like I came out of the womb wearing a full uniform and a badge and a gun. But when we were their age, we weren't much different, were we? You know, I remember when I turned 21 years old, I thought I was the cat's meow. Oh, I had it all together. 21 years old, I could drink, I could go to bars. I was in the military. I had lived in foreign countries. Oh, yeah, I had arrived. Then I turned 22. I look back at when I was 21, and I go, you know what? You didn't know Jack. Then I turned 23. I look back at when I was 21, and I'm like, you really didn't know anything. But it was an epiphany moment for me, and I recognized that each and every day is a gift and that we can learn something from all of our time here on earth. And that's what I espoused to do, was to take every day as a blessing and a learning experience. Now, fortunately, I hadn't squandered one-third of my father's estate, but I did learn valuable lessons. Sometimes it takes losing everything, digging ourselves so far into a that the only thing to do is to look up for help. Oh, and by the way, stop digging. (laughs) The crazy thing is, if we had only started there when we began, we might have saved ourselves a lot of pain and suffering. Amen? Yeah. So you also have to go ahead and respect the humility of this son. He knows he blew it. And he's not so arrogant as to go back to his dad and go, Hey, Pop, I'm taking my old room back. (laughs) No, what is it that he says? He says, make me like one of your hired servants. Remember, there was different classes of servants, right? Here it was, there would have been the servant that lived on the property, that served the master, and if you will, would have been in uh, full-time employment. Hired servants were those that were gathered, for example, during the harvest, or there was extra work that needed to be done during a busy time of the year. And we read about those in the parable of the workers in the vineyard. In Matthew 20, verse 1, it states, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. See, that's what this prodigal son was saying. He was humbling himself and asking his father to become one of these. Verse 20. 
And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Okay, bunch of points about this. First off, it says the father saw him. Do you know what this speaks of? The father was actively looking for the return of his son. This should be reassuring to you and to me. See, even when we mess up, when we go great distances, we feel the shame of our sin. Our heavenly father hasn't turned his back on us. No, the exact opposite. He's waiting there with open arms for us to come back to him. Now, second, it says, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran. This would have been huge from the standpoint of the son. First of all, it was considered undignified or unglorified for an older person to run in the Jewish culture. They would have had to hike up their tunic and their robe, exposing their pasty white uh, legs and showing everybody. You know, I have pasty white legs, but I call it my mountain white look from winter and not tanning. But exposing the legs was something that here it was, you just didn't do. Have you ever seen an older person run? Better yet, have you ever seen Tom Cruise? 1986, the volleyball scene in Top Gun, right? He's in pretty good shape. And then, here it is, Mission Impossible. 1996 was the first one that they did. He was 34 then. And they just released the latest in the series of the Mission Impossible. And we still see Tom doing his own stunts, fighting, and yes, running. At 61. Now, don't get me wrong. I hope I look as good at 61 as he does. But a 60-year-old run, uh, running Tom, it just isn't, well, let's say, as fluent as young Tom. So we see the father here running to his son. And then it says, and he fell on his neck and kissed him. Does this seem like a father who's mad or upset with him? But you see, I believe also that there was a reason why he did this. He was not only saying, hey, you are welcome back into the family, but he was also saying to everybody else, hands off. Because what the son had done, he could have been killed for it. And we find this in Deuteronomy 21. But if you want to find out more about that, come out to our fireside chat as we're going to delve deep into uh, our prodigal here. Now, by all means, the father should have been mad, right? I mean, by earthly standards and absolutely shameful by pharisaical standards. But this also shows the mercy and grace of our heavenly father. He is willing to forgive and forget his son's wrongs. And he's willing to forget and forgive ours too. And that brings us to our second point today. Forgive and forget. Forgive and forget. Psalm 103 verse 12 states, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And thank God for that. Verse 21. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. Notice he doesn't even get the opportunity to finish his statement of repentance and to offer up to be a higher servant when the father cuts him off. And what does the father say? Oy vey, do you know how much I've worried about you? You must be a mashugada, crazy to think I'd take you back. Is that what he says? Let's read on. Verse 22, but the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Now, I'm sure that as the prodigal was heading home, he thought to himself, I've sowed my wild oats and now my father is going to bring out the threshing machine. But what did the father do? He gave his son a robe for his back. Now, the word robe here in Greek is stole, and it means the loose garment uh, for men extending to their feet, worn by kings, priests, and persons of rank. Another translation is that which gives me honor. It wasn't an old hoodie sweatshirt that he tosses to his son with holes in it. No, it was wear this robe 
because you're part of the family. But there was more. He puts a ring on his hand. This more than likely would have been a signet ring. In other words, a ring with a family crest on it. And this is the same type of ring that they would use when letters were sent and they would drip wax on it or scrolls. And then you would take the ring and you'd press it into that soft wax, signifying that this was authentic and the information inside was from specifically that sender. It also represents the son's acceptance back into the family. Then there were shoes on his feet and a meal for his growling stomach. You know, even in semantic cultures today, it's they have to make a sacrifice of threshold. And that means that any time that they would return from a journey, they have to atone for sins committed while they were away. So too, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, was slain for our sins in order that we can be welcomed home again. We see the father's acceptance of the son's confession and refuses to make him a servant. Instead, the returning son was made a full member of the family again. Why? Because the son's confession of sin brought full restoration. And that applies to you and to me too. Verse 23. And, being the, uh, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat. For this my son was dead and is alive again. And he was lost, underline it, and found, underline it. And they began to be merry. So in continuing this thread, again, underline those things. And when we look at merry and rejoice, the word for rejoice means to delight with a thing. The word here used for merry means to rejoice in. So both words have the same meaning. Do you see how much the father rejoices when the return of his son is there? Just as we saw in the first two parables, first regarding the sheep in verse 7, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. And in verse 10 about the coin, likewise I say to you there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You know, I almost wonder if there isn't like a party section in heaven where they're just constantly rejoices. Oh, yeah! There was another one. Yay! <laughs> Our Heavenly Father sacrifices so much for you and for me. He wants that relationship with you and me. When we walk away, it pains Him. He wishes that none should perish. But we're going to see quite the opposite from our Pharisees. Pharisees would say something like, The only thing sinners are good for is to keep the fires of hell hot. But here, we see how much a father rejoices over those that were lost and then found. Don't give in to the lies of the enemy. When you sin, Satan is going to be the first one to accuse you and condemn you. You can never go back home. You can't go back to that church. God will never expect you, especially after what you did, how you sinned against him. I know what you did last summer. Don't listen to those lies. They're from the pit of hell. Our father accepts the prodigal. He accepts you and me, and he rejoices. So we're about to transition from the younger son to the older one. The younger son represents you and me. The son. Who do you think the older one represents in this parable? The Pharisees. Keep that in mind as we read on in verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard the music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the, fa the fatted calf. Now, we've read about the fatted calf a few times already. This was no small thing. It wasn't like the father was just serving a turkey dinner. Uh, now, granted, in Thanksgiving, that feeds a whole lot of people, doesn't it? No, this would have been the fatted calf. Now, one of our members here, Tina, she bought half of a steer. I saw her freezer. It was overflowing, and that was just half of a steer. So the fatted calf here would have gone ahead and fed the whole town. 
let's see if we can take this story and put it into a modern perspective. Now, since we were just talking about the Winter family, we'll continue with them. Brooklyn, the older child, comes home and sees a brand new cherry red Ferrari sitting in the driveway. Jill comes out, and as Brooklyn asks, who's this for? Jill responds, your mom got it for Brennan, the younger son. And she was like, what? <laughs> I do the dishes. I clean the house. I clean the bathrooms. I cook the dinners. And he's getting a brand new red cherry Ferrari for free? <laughs> you can understand her dismay. But I'm sure the older sibling in our parable isn't going to act this way. Let's read on. Verse 28. But he was angry and wouldn't go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. So the older brother runs into the house, finds the younger brother, wraps his arms around him, says, oh, thank God almighty, you're home. I missed you so much. Welcome, brother, welcome. No, <laughs> the older brother wouldn't even go into the house. He was so upset. So much so that the father has to come out to him. Aren't you glad that our heavenly father comes out to us? Is there for us even when we're not perfect? Even when we're struggling? Now, he doesn't just come out of the house, but it says the father came out and pleaded with him. How many times has God pleaded with you? Don't have that drink. Don't click on that website. Don't covet what she has. Come back to me. Come home. Let's not be like the older brother. Let's not be like our Pharisees in this parable. Now notice, the older brother doesn't even call the younger brother by his name. He says, this son. That's how much disdain he has for his brother and his father. Again, he thinks this is shameful for the father to be acting this way. And that's how much disdain the Pharisees and the scribes had for Jesus. The Pharisees said, we put on priestly robes. We taught in your temples. We offered up the sacrifices and kept your laws and then some. Yet you would dine with tax collectors and sinners? Mercy and grace should be our bookends in our lives. And that brings us to our third and our final point today. Live with mercy and grace. Live with mercy and grace. In his mercy, God upholds what we do deserve. In his grace, God heaps upon us infinite blessings we do not deserve. In mercy, he withholds what we did merit, eternal wrath. And in grace, pours upon us what we could never merit, eternal life, infinite joy, and being one with Christ. Amen? Amen. Yes. Verse 31. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry, underline it, and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost, underline it, and is found. Imagine what would have happened if the prodigal had been welcomed by his self-righteous elder brother rather than his merciful father. Because a lot of prodigal people are greeted by elder brothers, by self-righteous Christians. They think they cannot go home to the father, that forgiveness and mercy is too much to hope for, that their only choice is to return to the pig slop of the far country. How disappointing. You see, we are all prodigals. Amen? Amen? Elder brother and younger brother alike. We are all lost, found, and God still rejoices when we come back to him. Each of the three positions of the parable presented here in Luke 15 speaks of a different aspect of sin. 
The sheep was lost due to foolishness. The coin was lost due to the carelessness of another. And the son was lost due to his rebelliousness. And I believe that virtually any sin can be categorized in one of these three characteristics. Sometimes we make foolish mistakes. Other times, as in the case of child abuse, the sins of others leave their marks upon us. And oftentimes, we are intentionally and willfully rebellious. I also believe that most people have, can be very understanding towards any two of those three reasons for sin, but become an elder brother regarding the third. And it's different for a different third for each person. Some people see a brother caught in a foolish sin and their heart goes out to him. Or they'll catch somebody hurt by an unloving spouse and will offer help and healing to them. But when it comes to the rebellious, all they can say is, you should have known better. Others say, I can relate to the rebel what it feels like to hear the call of that faraway country. And I can relate to the one who makes foolish mistakes. Why can't those who are abused just get over it and move on? And yet still others can relate to those who are lost because of another's carelessness or the one who stubbornly chooses to walk in rebelliousness, but they can't figure out how someone could be so dumb to wander off in foolishness. But here's the good news, folks. The Father feels compassion for all three. God doesn't say to the foolish, you idiot, to the one who's abused, grow up, or to the rebellious, you're getting what you deserve. No, he runs to meet all three equally the moment they turn towards him. That's the kind of God we serve. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Would you pray with me? Lord, when I think about the grace and the mercy that's been given to me in my life, and God, how you would still continue to use a broken man like myself, Lord, I bow down to you. I humble myself. And God, know that you can even use cracked pots, broken vessels such as us. Dear God, I pray that you would use us mightily, that you would use us in order to serve you, and to you be all the glory. God, you are such a good and a precious heavenly Father. You are holy, and it is right to give you worship and praise. So, Lord, as we come before you today, truly, let us leave this place a little bit changed and a little bit closer to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And it's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Would everyone please stand for the last song?
gentlemen your calls to action today number one repent and change directions there's so many in society that think they can just say I'm sorry and think that there's no consequences or that they can keep doing the same thing dare I mention our politicians <laughs> when we fall short and we will repent then change direction don't keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result remember that's one of the definitions of insanity repent Get right with God and then go as far as possible in the other direction, away from sin and towards our Father. Number two, forgive and forget. That can be a hard one. But Adam, you don't know what they did to me. But God does, and he knows what you did to him. You and I placed his son on the cross because of your sins and mine. You see, when we put it in that kind of a perspective, None of us have a right to hold a grudge. Forgive and forget. And lastly, live with mercy and grace. So after you've forgiven someone, issue that mercy and grace that they don't deserve. You and I deserve damnation and eternal separation from our Heavenly Father based on our sins alone. It's not easy to forgive, but it's right. Right for the one who fell short, right in the eyes of God. And God gives us that perfect example in his son. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Amen? Amen. Amen. May God bless you and keep you. Shalom. If there's anybody who needs prayer, just either have a seat and somebody from our prayer team will be around, or I'll be down front. Have an awesome day, folks. <laughs>